Zuan, tell us about an OPSEC blunder you've encountered, experienced, or observed. Yeah, sure. So I was tracking these uh, smugglers from Slovakia, and we were hunting them for months. Uh, we couldn't get any information on them. And every time they crossed the border into Norway, they were carrying guns, drugs, uh, and uh, other illegal stuff. One day, I was looking at uh, some social media profiles, and I came along a barbecue party. And on that Facebook page, I saw everyone involved in that smuggling ring. And as they posted videos and photos of them barbecuing, they also took uh, images of their license plates. So let's just say that the next time they came into Norway, it wasn't as fun to cross the border. So you're saying that you may have potentially recruited notable or infamous Norwegian musicians to be their welcoming party? Something like that. Maybe some black metal playing uh, on the border. Yeah. Hey, that that's all good with me, uh, especially if it's Demi Borgir. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, that's the thing. OSINT is so addictive because... It's so easy to separate from reality while you're doing the investigation. You start and then you look at the clock and you're like, oh, crap, I should have been in bed like five hours ago. Oh, yeah. 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 And that's also something that I don't like about CTFs. And it's something that I think we're sort of struggling with as well, because we do have a lot of... um, challenging tasks that you need to do but people aren't willing to be stuck on something <laughs> and I, and i'm trying to say that there's a lot to be there's a lot to be learned from being stuck on something and in the real world you're going to be stuck on something for days months weeks uh, i still have a case that i think about every week that i'm trying to solve that is probably a year uh, old now so yeah, there's value in being stuck. And in the real world, you're not going to have hints. You're not going to have someone. Yeah, you're going to have colleagues that can help you, but you're not going to have someone blurb up the the direction you need to go in to be uh, successful in finding what you need to find. Yeah, I mean, in real life, let's face it. In real life, you can sometimes ask for some help. You can go into a Discord and say, hey, I'm loosely doing this. I need help with this. But in like the real investigations, especially the ones that you're getting paid for, you're not necessarily going to be able to hop in and say, hey, I need help finding this one particular thing because of NDAs or whatnot. Yeah. And the other norm, not finding anything, that is also common. It happens all the time. But somehow we don't talk about that in OSINT because we're all successful in what we do. We we always find what we're looking for. No (laughs) one hits a wall ever. Well, Uh, I mean, you know the saying that the uh, lack of something is also something. Yeah. Which isn't necessarily something we'd have in a scenario like we (laughs) it'll everything will have an answer. But in life, when you're doing a case, like sometimes you just report that there is nothing. Yeah, exactly. The number of times I've done a consulting gig with someone and I'm like, I'm going to be honest with you. I might be able to find something. I might not. And usually I coordinate with the client and we set a time threshold and say, okay, well, if I've not found anything by this amount of time, I'll come back to you. And it's up to you whether you want me to put more time in it or if you want to just call it good there. But yeah. The reality is sometimes there's little to nothing to find. Sometimes you, like, for example, one of the redacted cases that I use in the report writing course that I just released uh, was an Instagram harassment case where somebody was harassing somebody else via Instagram. And I told the client, I may be able to prove that it's the person you think it is. I may disprove that it's the person you think it is. And ultimately, I was able to neither prove nor disprove. But what I did 
what I was able to come up with was enough stuff that in the hands of an attorney, they could exercise legal processes, whether that be subpoenas or anything else, or go through a court uh, or law enforcement to get a warrant to at least ask the social media platforms the right questions. So here's enough borderline probable cause that it could be this person, but you need to go the correct avenues to get that data. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, That's a very good point. And especially in intelligence or any other job, really, where you're part of a team, there might be other sources than open sources that are important to answer the question that you're working on. So if you're if you're trying to learn more about uh, a certain topic, the OSINT analyst may come up with nothing, but someone else who works for or works in human, for instance, they may might be successful in answering what you're looking for. So it's all all depends on what you do and what you find or not find. Continuing <laughs> uh, with today's trend of asking the hard questions, um, is SOCMENT, social media intelligence, is it purely subordinate to OSINT? Uh, I'm not sh- entirely sure what you mean by that, but... Is it entirely a subordinate discipline of OSINT? Is all social media intelligence OSINT? Uh, no. No, I wouldn't think so. Uh, especially if you stay true to the int in OSINT, because uh, there's a lot of people who do work in, on social media that are not not producing intelligence, they're not doing investigations. Um, So, yeah. Agreed. And honestly, I I always like to ask that question because think of the things that can be acquired from social media via legal constructs, such as warrants, subpoenas, national security letters, et cetera, right? Right. Think of the things that law enforcement and intelligence and just private investigators and whatnot can gain access to by going through the right legal process. So there are some things you can get that way. There are some things you can't. And my other argument with that is the um, Firehose APIs, right? Firehose APIs, yes, they are technically available to everyone, but let's be honest. They're prohibitively expensive. Yeah, you're going to be a major vendor if you if you want access to <laughs> to those kinds of uh, of data points or APIs. Yeah. So, um, okay, I'm going to ask another difficult question just to get your take on it. And this is boiling over from the webinar earlier today as well. Should cell phones and internet connectivity be considered critical infrastructure? Yes. Yes. Even if doing so warrants government oversight and control over what can and cannot be used with it, such as the case of TikTok. So in the U.S., there's a movement to potentially ban TikTok from uh, Americans being able to download it. If yeah. they, if they classify cell phones and internet connectivity as critical infrastructure, that would give government the leg they would need to be able to say it's banned. Yeah, we have that issue in Norway now where the uh, secret police and uh, our version of the CIA, they want access to to store uh, open source data. Basically, they want to take and make like an OSINT stream and then save every bit of information that is ever posted on the internet in Norway. And 
I'm not too sure that's a good idea, even though they they mean well and they want to protect protect us. Uh, but at the same time, uh, for instance, leaving decisions of OPSEC uh, up to a senator or a politician <laughs> is not a good idea. They need some uh, help, uh, and I think also also the civilians need help in assessing what we consider good apps and bad apps. Um, and there should probably be a limit to how much a person can be uh, a product. So like, right, right now, TikTok, uh, the people who use the, the platform are the product. That's why it's free, of course. So I think we should look into putting some limits on that instead. And if they classify it as critical infrastructure, doesn't that also give access to funding and such to protect it because it is critical. I mean, our, it is critical to our functioning. Um, I, all, I, I know that they get more oversight that way as well. Right. It That's what it boils down to. And, you know, not to fully spoil the TLDR of the webinar earlier, but my big complaint with it, I'm not I am not pro TikTok ban. I am not anti TikTok ban. I am not pro TikTok. I'm not anti TikTok. Did I create a TikTok for the Ascension? Yes. I've posted a total of two videos to it, but they've also been posted elsewhere. So who cares? That being said, my big concern is the precedent that it sets. Yeah. First TikTok, then LinkedIn, then Facebook, which, you know, the mobile apps, I don't care about the mobile apps. I don't use the mobile apps. If I have to have the mobile app, I will install it, do what I've got to do, and then remove it because, quite frankly, Facebook scared me to death. Uh, it recommended people out of a contact list in an email account that I was temporarily logged into. And I was like, it was not supposed to have that access. So I will not install the Facebook app for that reason. But that's my big concern. And then the other side of it is we're, we're beating the drum in the U.S. about CCP being bad, which I don't disagree with. We're beating the drum about this company doing all this stuff. But where's the conversation about VK? Where's the conversation about Yandex and Sputnik and Russian disinformation? You know, where's the conversation about... American companies doing it. That's my problem. Yeah, I mean, you say all this as though we're not beholden to social media of all types at all Agreed. times. Agreed. It, yeah. It's not that picture I see. It's like, hey, here's a cabin. It's got all the food you need for a year. It's got everything you need for a year. It just doesn't have any phone or internet connectivity. Could you stay in there for $100,000? I'm like, yeah. I, uh, I don't think I could. <laughs> I, I say, well, I say that, but, you know, whether I actually can or cannot, that's a different story. But also, as, as someone who's seen what law enforcement can do on, on like, I've, I've seen the capabilities of the, the teams that uh, investigates the, the worst crimes on, on the planet. I usually say that when those guys are on on your bot and they're after you, you're not getting away. So it's scary that they feel like they need to gather all that data to have a upper hand on things like terrorism. I do think they're they're using a lot of the uh, early 2000s uh, rhetoric to to take these laws a bit further than they need to go. And especially with open open data uh, for for OSINT stuff, um, I have a hard time defending uh, them storing so much data. Uh, it's a, it's really a tough question, and I'm the same as you, Joe. I don't I don't hate TikTok. I think it's a good platform for its use, and I am not pro TikTok, and I'm I don't think it should be banned either. It, it is a hard topic for sure and I, i'm not sure if the politicians are um, capable and i i'm not sure if they have the right tools to deal with matters like these yeah i mean the fact that i was able to put together a six minute blooper video of 
the of U.S. politicians asking stupid questions. Yeah, that I mean, do we need to have the conversation about TikTok? Yes, but at the same time, the way they're going about it, it's also making a laughing stock out of the U.S. right now. Yeah, I would be much. I am much more scared about Midjourney, Chat GPT, and other AI platforms when it comes yeah. to social media. That is oh, a yeah. much larger threat, even to OSINT. So I think that's probably something we should discuss uh, as a nation and as as uh, people instead. Agreed. Um, so let's see here. What what are some misconceptions that you all hear about OSINT? Mm. Oh, well, I guess it's the one that you need to know programming. You need to be like a super hacker, uh, all of those type of, types of things. Uh, I also, that it's just stalking. Yeah, but I also want to fight the older intelligence uh, generation where they say that you need to be a domain expert uh, before you are like an OSINT analyst. So for instance, you need to be really good at geopolitics before you can do any OSINT work. And I really hate that. I think law enforcement agencies are really missing out on some major talent when they require applicants to have some sort of geopolitic uh, understanding of like Ukraine, Russia, or whatever it is. If they get OSINT analysts that are OSINT people through and through, they will have major success in what they're trying to do. That's my biggest pet peeve, you know. Or right that now. people outside of government agencies can't aren't doing OSINT. Yeah, like some or people who think they do OSINT, but they do e-discovery. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's definitely a big one. Not not that is anything wrong with e-discovery, but yeah, uh, I think I think there's a lot of people who who think they're doing OSINT when Missing what they're minutes. essentially, yeah, what what they're essentially doing is e-discovery. They're trying to discover digital assets. Yeah. Oh, and if I can mention one last thing, uh, I th- I do believe that a lot of people think OSINT is, for instance, if you work on a case like we touched on earlier, OS- the OSINT person is essentially just dumping everything they can find on a person if if the case is revolved around a person are you so, looking into my cases that i'm doing <laughs> but i mean like i specialize in that yeah but uh, but i mean i mean if you're working in case um it's not like every case will require you to to define everything on a person they might be looking for something super specific like can you place this person in a certain area uh, on a date uh, and you can use social media for that that doesn't mean you need to like dump their entire facebook instagram snapchat into a document and then just send that off and that's like your hosted product <laughs> well uh, i mean it, sometimes you can't even collect all that information and store it <laughs> yes, of, of course, that may be part of your collection during uh, during your your work, but you wouldn't send that off to the stakeholder. Uh, right. That, that gets into the territory of information versus intelligence, right? Because ultimately what we're doing is we are getting paid to provide context. And that's what we have to do. We need to apply that analysis and context. That's ultimately the two things we're getting paid for writing a report and providing context. And yeah. it's the number, like it's somewhat frustrating when, when someone's just breaking in and they want to collect everything about everyone and keep it forever. But usually, you know, you can have that conversation and be like, Hey, you don't necessarily want to go that route. Here's why blah, 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 the liability. Usually GDPR is a pretty good way to scare people with that um, or something to that effect. But Yeah, I mean, it's more, in my opinion, it's a lot more than just going and casting a huge wide net or going saning uh, for just 
a bunch of stuff because that's not really that different than say data science. Yeah. And nothing wrong with data science. I mean, I, I appreciate it, but the, the reality being we need to provide that context. We need to better explain in the most amicable term possible why something is important, why, why the stakeholder, the reader, whomever should care. Yep. Right. Yeah. The, what's the so what is the one why, thing I always hear. So why, where's the so what? Why do I need to stop watching cat videos and put pants on <laughs> right. to care about this? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. You have to present something that someone's going to care about, not just data in a word file. Right. It's like, yes, those are all words. That is that is correct. But, um, tell <laughs> and me I think, yeah, and I think a lot of new people are going to be surprised how a stakeholder is not interested in the OSIT bit. So you don't need to tell them how you found the information. It's not like they they care about, oh, you found a new cool tool or a script. That doesn't matter. They I, just need yeah. to know the info. When I'm reporting, I may say through this particular technique, I found this. I I won't explain how the technique works. If they want to come back and ask that question and see a demo, I'm more than happy to do so. You can't give them the secret sauce, Joe. <laughs> well, hey, I mean, <laughs> you know how it goes. But yeah, at the you same should. time, you, it depends on what you're writing for, right? If you're writing for something that's going to go to, say, litigation, you need to write with a somewhat different tone than if you are writing something that the main stakeholder is your local sock, right? Um, or if you're doing like a case where, you know, law enforcement has to reenact or, or an agency needs to like reproduce what you found on their side, yep. um, you know, then you have to tell them how you did it and exactly how you found it. Yeah. On that note, have you seen this? A low hack five. They've got a gadget for OSINT now. I always look at this stuff and I'm like, oh, I want it. But like, what What would I actually do with it? Well, you, you know what? Like, I'm, I want the flipper and I'm like, eh, but would I actually do anything with it? Right here is an OSINT tool if I've ever seen one. What you do is you plug it you put it in line with the HDMI cable. So you just need this and another HDMI cable and it records everything going into that monitor and feeds it back to their cloud. So realistically, like I'll, I'll tell you, I did an investigation. It involved some presidential appointed people. I'll just leave it that vague, right? It was going to litigation. And I knew that Everything I did was going to be scrutinized and there were going to be holes shot in it every which way they could. So I didn't use one of these. I actually just did screen captures of the investigations. I did all the investigation on one particular monitor and did it that way. But um, for that same investigation, I ran PCAPs the whole time. So the whole stream of everything like that was the perfect use case for you need a sterile system so that you can run PCAPs and you don't have to worry about like your personal Facebook phoning home to Facebook because you have a browser window open uh, somewhere that's phoning home or something like that. It literally captured everything I needed for the investigation. I also exported out all my system network and application logs uh, that's why I also have History Master here as well, which shows everything that I look for. And then if I go to sync, I can just export this into a CSV. I used all of this stuff for that one particular investigation. But had had the screen crab been out then or me be aware of it, I would have put a screen crab in line with it as well. Because then that way you're seeing the packet captures, which, yes, they can be edited. But that's a certain level of technical difficulty that most people are not going to go through the trouble of doing. I, I can think of a couple of people that would, that if I needed to create a fake PCAP, I would call up, but uh, having this and PCAPs that right there, this pretty much tells the entire story. You know, you hand this and a packet capture off to law enforcement or a, a court, they really can't argue it at all. 
at that point. <laughs> it's like essentially yeah. without saving the files. Right. Yeah. And the links. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, of course, you know, Hunchly is a great tool as well. And there's, there's not, I don't have a problem with Hunchly. Uh, you know, I use Hunchly and uh, Zotero as well, but it's just one of those, um, one of those cases that you've got to speak their language. And, you know, with Hunchly and Zotero, it captures everything, but at the same time, this is capturing a cohesive video. So you can show yeah. every single step, every rabbit hole, and you're not relying on it to capture. And the other thing is you don't have to worry about being in a Chrome enabled browser for it to work as well. That's true. That's true. It is Chrome. based. Although, although with Zotero, you don't have to use Chrome either. You can use anything, but yeah, the, the point still stands though, but you know, I know Hack5 is not marketing this as an OSINT tool, but that really, it would work darn good for that. I know a lot of the people in law, law enforcement who use VMs have set up, like you have the you have some native software that will record everything that happens on a VM, uh, even the network traffic. So there are some, I know some people have thought of this. Um, yeah. But they're doing it on like HyperX or yeah, some hypervisor software. Yeah, definitely good stuff. So uh here's the final question I've got for you. Because we uh we've been going for a while. Um is it when does my book come out? No, that's gonna be after <laughs> this. That that's that's in the quote housekeeping segment. I'm just kidding. I almost forgot that we were gonna talk about it. So it's all good. Hey. As a fellow author, I'm not going to let you. <laughs> I appreciate um, it. Uh, I was watching Letter Kenny earlier, so it's all I can do to not say that's what I appreciate about you. Because um, <laughs> I, I do watch copious amounts of Letter Kenny. Um, <laughs> that being said, though, um, how do you all react when you hear someone say, oh, since easy? <laughs> I mean, there are times that OSINT is easy. I've had cases where it felt pretty easy, but then again, like not, not everyone thinks the same way. Not everyone is good at the same things. You know, I might be better at, I don't know, working American. on 50 different projects at one time than somebody else or, you know, so to say it's easy, easy for who, what's easy. Like, it's all dependent. Yeah, I agree. Um, as Ray said, some days are easier than others, but I think I think OSINT is, like being an OSINT analyst is not something that everyone can do, uh, unfortunately. And to be successful at it, you have to have some qualities that are not found in everyone, but they, they can, of course, be trained. But you need you need a set of, um, yeah, you, you need a good foundation. And I think if someone says that OSINT is easy, it speaks to their limited understanding of the field. I like to say that the golden age of OSINT is ahead of us. We are only getting started. You like to and say that? I like to say that. And it's it's when your quote. It is. Um, I lost my, yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, not, now I lost it, Ray. I'm sorry. Uh, the golden age of OSINT is still ahead of us. There's so much to learn. Yes. And There's it's going to so be much still coming. I think it's going to be harder and harder to do what we do. It's not going to be easier. So that's my pitch. Agree. Yeah, I don't. I mean, like I sometimes I think it's easy, but I also I work terribly in a vacuum. I cannot work by myself very well. Um, I work best with a group of people where I can just dump ideas and then they give me more ideas and then I pivot off of those ideas. And and that's how I work well. So it's easier for me in that. In that format, um, a lot harder to get started when it's just myself. So it's it's yeah. so dependent on like what you're doing, when and with who and how you work. And, and I think I know which 
Twitter thread this question is coming from. Uh, and I do think that there's a lot of misconceptions about what OSIN really means. So for some, it may mean just reading the news and then going to your stakeholder and be like, oh yeah, uh, this newspaper said this and this newspaper said this. Here's the top 10 articles you should read today or this week. That is not what OSIN is at all. What? OSINT's not having a paperly account? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'd say that's part of it to, yeah. to find the news, but then but then add the extra. Like, okay, so you found, I don't know, this thing is shipping weapons here. Yeah. Why does that matter? Who yeah, and, profits? Like, and, ask those deeper questions. And before, before there's any anything that may think like anything that I just said that makes anyone think that I'm making fun of anyone for having a paperly account. I'm not uh, because there is a, there is an OSIN account that does publish a really good paperly document close to daily. And it's of high value. Their paperly is so well curated because I've tried to create a paperly and I just don't have the bandwidth to do it. So I'm not hating on anyone for paperly. If you can synthesize the right sources and get the right stuff in there, that's not just straight hot garbage. You are a rock star. Um, but yeah, it's separating the signal from the noise is definitely a very important trait um, from the chat. Ghost case, Ghostface Killer likes to label himself as the world's okayest investi- OSINT investigator. So it sets the bar not too high or too low. <laughs> Um, I feel that, that's that's fair. That reminds me of a joke. Uh, I was looking to before I adopted Gord, uh, the bulldog. Um, I was looking at a variety of dogs, and I I made a joke that I was going to get a Great Dane. And <laughs> the caveat was I was only going to get a Great Dane if I could get the runt of the litter, so that when I took it for a walk and somebody said, "Hey, is that a Great Dane?" I could say. No, he's the runt. I I only got an okay Dane. <laughs> wow, yeah. there's your dad joke. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I heard one earlier today that was a real. It was a real zinger, but I've already forgot it. I'll have to go back and find it. Um, just Darn. off the cuff, how do you see OSINT evolving related to not necessarily? GPT and that kind of stuff or like Google Bard or any of that, but just the interdependencies between data science and OSINT. And I'm specifically looking at things like sentiment analysis and NLP, like the natural language processing, not the neuro-linguistic programming stuff that we hear about in social engineering. I mean, I think sentiment analysis is something people want. Um, I'm not quite sure that many people know why. <laughs> like, I think I think they're asking for it, um, but they don't know what they want to get out of it yet. They just like know the words. <laughs> like, oh, people are looking for sentiment. Uh, I want to know what people think. Um, but making that some sort of intelligence is a lot harder. Um, and as yeah. far as like chat GPT stuff, I. I I'm thrilled. <laughs> I use it all the time for OSINT, um, you know, especially with maritime stuff. Uh, when you're looking at ports, there's like so many things going on at ports until they're not always listed on websites. The details are not always there. So if I can type in like, what are the top 10 companies at this port? And it gives me it, even if it's not completely accurate, um, which it probably won't be, it gives me a really good starting point to like actually investigate it versus a blank canvas where I have to go searching all around the internet for who lists the these things in, I don't know, China, um, in Chinese that I can't read, um, that I have to find. I, I let it do the, the grunt work and then I just work off of that sometimes. Yeah, no, I, I see. There's already a shift in, especially intelligence, where 
those 25 pages of reporting is seen as not so useful anymore. And I think NLPs are going to push that sent sentiment of writing shorter stuff even more, because right now we could just use AI to write a big, big report, uh, a big accurate report, and no one's going to read it. So yeah, I, I think we're, we're, we're going to see a push towards uh, more accurate uh, shorter descriptions of uh, the things you find. Yeah, I, now, I agree. And I also think that even though all of these tools for data science, automation, and processing larger amounts of data is coming, it's still going to be our job as OSINT analysts to identify the important data sources that we need. Uh, so a data scientist may come to us and be like, hey, I need all license plates for a specific state or something. Uh, I, I want to scrape that. Uh, how, can you identify a good uh, source for that and a technique to, to retrieve that information? And then they can scale that up. On the other side, it makes it a lot harder to do <laughs> investigations, especially with like mid-journey and, and things like that, that deep fakes and all those that can make these things that are not real. Um, and yeah. they're getting so, so accurate. Yeah, I think we're going to see a more segregated internet. Like, we grew up with major uh, social media platforms that took their turn in being popular, uh, like MySpace, and then you had Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat came along. And if you look at the kids these days, they will have a ton of apps where they do very platform specific things. So they'll go for they'll go on Instagram to share pictures of their holiday, but they'll go on TikTok to share like a party, short party video or whatever, or even Snapchat. And I think in the coming years, we're going to see more specific platforms uh, come up that will be popular. And as a result of that, the internet is going to be more segregated. Yep, that makes total sense. So um, as we start to wrap up, uh, before we get to the book, uh, let's give a plug for case scenarios in terms of uh, coupon code in terms of what's next, what people can expect, et cetera. So we have a 15% off coupon code for all of your followers. OSINT for you. Um, and on the last until April 29th upcoming, we have what the dark water scenario is out now. It's what's the time on that, Espen? Like how long does it take to complete? About 15 hours. Okay, 15 hours long. You're in the shoes of a journalist, investigative journalist. It's an environmental crime kind of thriller. And then we have upcoming the free scenario called Betrayal that's going to be out soon uh, about a husband that murders his wife or is on trial for murdering his wife. And you have to, you're a private investigator working for the prosecutor trying to prove whether he did it or not. Um, and that'll be a free one. And then, Aspen, do you want to talk about the the other ones that are coming out? Yeah, we, we aren't ready to share too much about those yet, but I can tell you that they're set in the UK and it's going to be a missing person scenario uh, where you are a uh, OSINT analyst working for the NCA in the UK. Uh, the other one uh, is set in Norway and that's going to be it's going to be around murders in Norway. That's all I'll tell you right now. So um, again, yeah, the code is OSINT for you. It's 15% off. Yes. And uh, we, we touched on this a bit earlier, but our scenarios is not instead of classroom training. It's not something you should do as your only input for OSINT training. It's meant to be a... Uh, practical training grounds where you can have fun. You can try out the things that you have uh, learned from from Joe and others. Um, it's not timed. It's like not work timed. at your own pace. <laughs> it's not about the points. You are gonna be stuck, but please remember, there's lots to be learned from from being stuck. You're gonna have fun, even though you're gonna be be stuck sometimes. And we on have, our Discord server, we have like a case section where you can go in and ask. 
you yes. know, people to work with you or, you know, ask questions, whatever. Yes, you're not alone. We are there to support you. If you have questions, you can reach out to us directly or in the chat. Uh, yeah. Ray, tell us about the book. Yes. So I've spent the last year of my life writing. It was supposed to be 400 pages. It uh, appears that they kept all my words and it's 450 now. <laughs> um, it's called Deep Dive, Exploring the Real World Value of Open Source Intelligence. And it releases May 9th. You can pre-order it now um, wherever books are sold. Amazon, Wiley, um, Barnes & Noble. It's a, it's a general book on OSINT. Um, I cover methodology. Uh, I mention a few tools, but I'm not like focused on tools. Uh, a lot of it is methodology. I start with... Um, kind of explaining what open source intelligence is, the intelligence cycle, kind of, you know, the adversarial mindset, operational security, things like that. And then the second part shifts into diving deeper into concepts, subject intelligence, social media analysis. We talk about business and organizational intelligence, big section on transportation, because I love it, boats, ships, uh, planes, rail, cars, trucks, um, and then critical infrastructure and industrial stuff, and then financial intelligence, crypto and um, NFTs. And uh, I fill it with lots of case studies and like real life examples. So you learn the concepts, the methodology, and then you see how it was used in a case or, or an example, something that really happened. And then I have pivot charts in there to show you how we work through the cases or how you might take a concept and pivot through to more information. Um, you can find more information about the book on raybaker.net. Um, I think Joe has it up. It, it is a really good book, even though I am the tech editor. It's not like any OSINT book that is out there. It would be a great uh, book to get for uh, case scenarios. It's going to help you a lot. Yeah. He wouldn't lie. He's Norwegian. They, they yeah, I would lie. tell you if it sucked. I promise. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll write your first bad review. There you go. <laughs> no, I'm very scared. <laughs> I'm very scared about reviews. I, we'll see. I will say that as another author, I, I was also terrified of bad reviews. I've not seen any bad reviews for practical social engineering yet that is not a challenge or a dare <laughs> do know that i do OSINT. so if you write a bad review i will find you <laughs> um, it's just really hard first of all see your words for a year and, and look at them and be like this is great and then you're like by the end this is terrible <laughs> why would anyone read this yeah. but it's it's like all it's in your head and it's very hard to put out your words and let people read it and then tell you whether they like it. Yeah. And I, I'll provide some sage advice from my own experience. I think I gave you the same advice for anyone looking to write an OSINT or social engineering book or anything dealing with like a technical concept, be prepared to take the same screenshots like eight times because things are going to change. Oh yeah. I tried not to. <laughs> That's why I didn't include. <laughs> no, there's like, no real super big step-by-steps or anything where you have to have a whole bunch of screenshots that might change. I have pivot charts that I made that should not change. Um, and they're also going to be, I'm going to have like additional information that I couldn't fit into the book in on my site, but a lot of it hopefully will not change. Although I wrote a lot about Twitter right, <laughs> right as Elon was crashing the whole thing down. And I was like, he better not kill Twitter after I just wrote about it. For my book, I used uh, No Starch Press's website as one of the websites I cloned for phishing pages. And they kept putting up new, they kept changing uh, their coupon codes and their discounts and stuff. So I had to <laughs> keep on taking new screenshots of it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the worst thing that I had to deal with was my pivot charts were too big. So they're like, well, you can only have them this size. And I'm like, ah can you turn the page sideways? Because I really want the whole thing. 
<laughs> so yeah. I made them turn them sideways so I could fit the whole thing on. So I'm going to so hit please you. Please with- like the pivot charts because they were very hard to make. I'm going to hit you with the same author question I've gotten hit with. Are you planning on doing an audiobook? I don't know. It's through Wiley Tech. So if they ask me to do an audiobook, I'll do one. If you guys want to listen to my voice for, I don't know, however long a 450 page book takes. Yeah. I looked at. Um... Yeah. I mean, this was such a new experience for me because I obviously have never written a book before. And I came up with the idea and I pitched it. And they're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Like I wasn't expecting the okay. So then I'm like, oh, okay. I got to like figure out how to write a book now. Yeah. Um, Because like before I pitched a no starch, I had bought Michael Basil's book about self-publishing. I was like, all right, well, I'm going to write a book. Um, So, all right, let's pitch. I pitched to one publisher and they wanted to split it up and not charge for it, which I don't, I don't care about the money a lot. But I do want to be somewhat compensated for my work. Uh, I don't want another company to be able to like make money off of my work without me getting something out of it. Um, So then I pitched to No Starch and they're like, we got a few questions. Let's have a call. And it was all like questions about ethics of social engineering. And after we discussed it, they're like, yep, here you go. Cool. (laughs) Get started. Yeah, I will say Wiley, working with Wiley was amazing the whole way through. They were great. Um, I, I had initially pitched a Maritime OSIM book, which I it was a little niche, but I'm still hoping maybe I get to write one. I tried to fill a lot of that into this one. So there's like a lot of Maritime stuff in there. Um, but I also got a lot of plane stuff and rail because I don't think that's covered anywhere. Um, I've so. seen a little bit covered uh the february web webinar with monica camacho she demonstrated some rail and auto osint type stuff but i hadn't i've i had not seen a lot of it before that and i've not seen a lot after that yeah and i feel like it just becomes more and more important you know all these rail crashes you know i I just like transportation. <laughs> I, I wanted to put as much as I could in there. Um, as much as I could fit in by going over 50 pages, I crammed it all in there. I I like to be transported, but I don't know about the transportation thing. Like for me, it's a lot of like, I fall down the rabbit holes looking at submarines, but that's also because I was on one. So they're very hard to track. Like, Submarine uh, racing is not exactly a spectator sport. <laughs> I do a lot of, you know, supply chain stuff and like tracking vessels and, you know, what weapons are they taking where or what, you know, sanctioned vessel is going where and, you know, what can I see when I'm looking in an area and once they hit a port, what trucks are they on? Are they taking a rail or taking a train into like a base or, something, you know, whatever. But that's that's the kind of stuff I like to do. I've actually got a picture from my days in the Navy. It's a submarine racing picture here. My boat was actually first place in this. Uh, Let me get the picture pulled up for you. It's purely unclassified, by the way. There we go. Yeah. (laughs) Nice. We we were winning. You know, nobody's there to know it. (laughs) Now, oh, I, but I have yet to find a good submarine on um, on satellite. Maybe I'll look out. We'll talk. <laughs> Please. I also I can I can give you some hints at where to look. I got a few places I look. I watch. We'll we'll, we'll trade notes. <laughs> that cool. that's that's what the thought leaders say, right? Let's trade notes. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Let's go ahead and wrap it up because I think we could probably go on for another three and a half hours or more. Uh, knowing that uh, Zuin's on the other side of the world, it's definitely close to or past his bedtime. So it's okay, he's on uh, U.S. time now. Oh, good. <laughs> oh God, no. It, <laughs> no. Once you get on what? U.S. time, we're gonna have to get you to drop the uh, the metric system and go imperial, though. That's never going to happen. Do you That's... or do you not have a clock set to U.S. time? 
Okay, so I may have two ovens, and one of them is like Ray time, and one of them is Norway time. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> That's how much I talk to Ray. <laughs> yep. Makes sense. All right. Thanks, everyone, and we'll catch you next time. If you are interested in on demand training, check out the Ascension Academy. Visit academy.theoscension.com. If you're interested in purchasing courses from the Ascension, you can do so in a variety of ways. The Ascension store, which is at theoscension.com slash courses slash store. You can purchase bundles, individual courses, and placeholders here. If you would like a custom bundle, please email bundles at theoscension.com for custom bundles or questions. You can follow us on Twitch. Ocent.mobi slash Twitch is the redirect. Ocent.mobi slash YouTube is the YouTube redirect. And also we maintain a couple of communities. On Discord, we maintain the Ascension Discord, which is Ocent.mobi slash Discord. And we are also members of Ocent Intelligence on LinkedIn, which you can join via Ocent.mobi slash Ocentelligence. There are the links to my social media as well as the Ascensions. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like this video, comment, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell.